hip dislocations and femoral head fractures. This is from the OTA core curriculum resident lecture series version five slides by Dr. Thomas Moore Jr. MD. Uh, I'm Saqib Rahman and I'm narrating these. Um, these are disclosures for these slides. So the objectives to understand hip anatomy and how it applies to the treatment of hip dislocations and femoral head fractures, recognize the associated injuries with hip dislocation and femoral head fracture, use the PIPKIN classification and other important variables to determine treatment alg algorithms for femoral head fracture, and to understand the expected outcomes and common complications associated with hip dislocation and femoral head fractures. So the hip joint is inherently stable, right? It doesn't dislocate with just minor trauma or the degree of trauma that you may get with a shoulder dislocation, which um, happens with, uh, you know, the shoulder is afforded more motion at the cost of stability and the hip is you know, afforded stability at the cost of more motion. So native hip dislocation, so to speak, meaning native, meaning not a total hip arthroplasty, uh, but just a joint dislocation of the hip, um, usually is a higher energy injury, mostly in young individuals. Uh, you can get a femoral head fracture as a result of the hip dislocation or maybe with a subluxation, and you really got to get these reduced promptly. So the hip is a ball and socket joint that makes it somewhat stable. It allows a reasonable range of motion, but it's fairly constrained compared to the shoulder, for instance. Uh, the acetabular labrum helps to deepen the socket. 40% of the femoral head contacts the acetabular articular cartilage, which is a little bit of a horseshoe shaped. And 10% of the femoral head contacts the labrum. Multiple large muscles use the hip joint as a fulcrum point. And this directly relates to hip stability and necessitates a constrained joint, essentially. And here you can see, at least on a coronal cross-section, what some of the important anatomic structures are. So the hip joint capsule is made up of multiple sort of coalescence of these ligaments, the iliofemoral ligament, pubofemoral ligament, ischiofemoral ligament, as shown here, uh, anteriorly on the bottom and posteriorly on the top. The femoral head forms, it's generally spherical, and in the overall forms about two-thirds of a sphere. The articular cartilage is thickest on the medial and central surfaces, and the acetabulum opens up facing obliquely a little bit anteriorly and inferiorly, and as mentioned before, it's horseshoe-shaped with the cartilage thickest laterally and peripherally. What about vascularity? So um, the medial femoral circumflex artery uh, as shown uh, here in the image, gives rise to the subsynovial intracapsular arterial ring, uh, including the lateral epiphyseal artery and its terminal branch. The ascending cervical arterial branches uh, are highly susceptible to kinking and compression with hip dislocation. So, um, you know, so as shown here, so that is what potentially can lead to ischemia if you leave a hip dislocated. What about associated injuries? Well, um, again, they're higher energy injuries. So you can get intra-abdominal injuries, chest, head injuries. 95% of these patients after an MVC are going to have some type of additional injury requiring hospital admission. And 25% may have major knee trauma. So a lot of times there's indirect trauma. Maybe you're in an MVC, knee hits the dashboard or something like that. Uh, and you have to look for those because they may not be as dramatic and make sure they're not a missed injury. So hip dislocation patients, um, again, 95% of associated injuries, sometimes are orthopedic only. Uh, 24, in this particular study, 24% head injuries, 21% craniofacial injuries, 21% thoracic injury, and many times these are multiple trauma patients. So... Um, you know, they require a evaluation by your by your general surgery trauma team, essentially. Um, sciatic nerve injury happens in 10% of uh, these in adults and 5% in pediatric hip dislocation. And usually what they'll get is the perineal division as most commonly infected. So they get a foot drop, but not necessarily uh, loss of plantar flexion.
You can also get an acetabulum fracture in many of these. So a lot of times with hip dislocation, you'll get like a posterior wall fracture, for example, and in fewer cases, you may get a femoral head fracture. Mechanism of injury, as we mentioned, uh, motor vehicle crash is very common, fall, uh, pedestrian struck by vehicle, industrial accidents, occasionally a sports-related injury, but in general, these are these tend to be higher energy injuries. So um, most of the time, these are going to be posterior, but uh, sometimes you're going to have anterior uh, dislocations as well. So um, in the posterior hip dislocations, you're going to have hip adduction, internal rotation, which can lead to pure hip dislocation. If you have less adduction or less internal rotation, you may be more likely to get a fracture dislocation um, in hips with less femoral antiversion. There could be an increased risk of pure hip dislocation. So there's a few factors, both anatomic as well as the mechanism and the vector of trauma that can lead to getting a fracture or not. Anterior hip dislocations typically happen with hyperabduction and extension. Uh, the position of the hip and mount of flexion determines the type of anterior hip dislocation. So it can be uh, inferior, like an obturator dislocation, or with extreme hip extension, you can get uh, anterior hip dislocation, essentially. Uh, and a, when you get these, femoral head impaction is common, uh, whereas with the posterior dislocations, you tend to get more of a shear injury. So on physical exam, uh, you may have the hip flexed, so the leg is going to appear internally rotated, shortened, adducted, um, in a pure dislocation. Now, if there's a femoral head neck shaft fracture, the exam may differ. It may actually not be quite as dramatic. In the anterior dislocation, there's going to be extreme external rotation and hip abduction. Um, and again, it might differ if it's not a pure dislocation. So what about imaging? So um, on your AP pelvis x-ray, you're going to look for hip congruity. Uh, you should be able to get some idea about the direction of dislocation uh, as described here. If it's anterior versus posterior, like if it's posterior, head should have less magnification. If it's anterior, it's probably going to be more magnification and look larger. Um, if you have a good image, you can proceed with hip reduction. Again, it's a timely thing. You want to do this as soon as possible. Uh, critically look for femoral head fractures, acetabular fractures, femoral neck fractures, pelvic ring injuries. CT scan with fine cuts can be helpful to identify those. You may have to get that after your reduction. If there is a femoral neck fracture, you may have to be very careful about stabiliz uh, stabilization um, because you may have a non-displaced femoral neck fracture that if you're not careful can displace. Uh, if you have an irreducible dislocation, it could be that uh, the head is impacted and uh, you can run the risk of creating a femoral neck fracture if you force the reduction. Post-reduction x-rays, you can get AP pelvis, you can get Jude views, especially if there's an acetabulum fracture. Thin cut CT is really helpful to help confirm uh, that you have a concentric reduction, if you have intraarticular fragments, impaction of the femoral head, uh, femoral head fractures, as well as acetabulum, marginal impaction can all be visualized nicely on CT scan. All right, I think we're gonna pause here and we will pick up with uh, classification in the next video.